So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 3Rs Collaborative and IQ MPS Systems webinar and workshop series. Today, we are going to be hosting the Vascular MPS workshop. Um, as a disclaimer, this webinar and workshop series is made up of companies um, that who may be competitors or customers of each other. Accordingly, nothing discussed during these webinars and workshops are intended to result in agreement on price, exclude suppliers from any market, or otherwise restrain competition. Those participating in this webinar and workshop series are instructed to avoid discussion of competitively sensitive subjects, including costs, prices, sales, product marketing, and other confidential information. In addition, neither the NA3RC nor the IQ will use contact information received during this collaboration for marketing purposes or engage in marketing or sales conduct during collaboration activities. So I'm going to give a brief introduction to our group, um, then allow the IQ to present about their group and talk a little bit about this series. So I am Megan LaFollette. I'm executive director at the 3Rs Collaborative. We're a nonprofit whose mission is to advance better science for both people and animals. And we do this through facilitating collaborative 3Rs opportunities. We really partner across the field. This is a picture of our current leadership team and board of directors and their institutional logos. And I hope you can appreciate that we span across academia, industry, other nonprofits, consultants, government, and more. Our MPS initiative system um, seeks to increase adoption and regulatory acceptance of MPS in coordination with animal studies. And what makes our group unique is that we're primarily formed of commercially available um, MPS technology providers. Um, you can see most of their logos up here, but we are open um, to anyone to join us. We have four key aims to provide thought leadership from developers, to facilitate discussion and collaboration and sharing, to direct um, have engagement between both developers and regulatory agencies, and develop external partnerships and collaborations to provide perspectives. And finally, we create resources to facilitate increased engagement with commercial MPS developers. We have four key work streams that include interfacing with end users, such as via these workshops, our regulatory subgroup that works on advancing regulatory acceptance, creating a technology expo, um, and creating educational presentations, posts, and resources. I'm going to fairly quickly go through some of the things that we've accomplished in the past couple of years. Um, in 2021, we started this webinar series with the IQ MPS. In 2022, we hosted our first reception with both our members in the IQ MPS and then continued this workshop series. Um, and we'll be continuing both our reception um, as well as our quarterly MPS workshops this um, year. So after this vasculature one, we will be doing GI and then lung in Q3 and Q4. For a regulatory group, um, we've done a number of different talks um, as well as publications. We're engaging with the FDA Alternative Methods Working Group um, as well as several other groups. And this year, we're really um, getting consensus on our publication, which has perspectives from commercial developers, um, regularly talking with the regulars, regulators, um, and presenting at the 3D Tissue Summit. We're also providing education and thought leadership. We do a variety of both um, social media posts, as well as very general introductory presentations about MPS um, to potential new end users. Um, we've had a presence at the MPS World Summit and represented the USA on the regional update panel, as well, have, um, as well as have presented or published a few articles about MPS as well. Um, this year, again, um, one of our focuses for education and thought leadership is we're going to be coming out with um, some information about the FDA Modernization Act and NPS. Um, and we'll also be presenting both at the World Congress on Alternatives and at ALEPS. Um, I do want to encourage you that if you're interested in finding more technology providers after this webinar to visit our technology hub, you can um, filter by organ type, disease model, and therapeutic area. And then um, feel free to submit any questions via the Q&A. Um, and if they are for a specific presenter, please put that presenter's name or company in the question. Um, they'll either be answered at the end of each presenter's talk or at the very end of the webinar as time um, permits. And if you do forget or having issues um, accessing the Q&A, you can always put it, them in the chat. 
Um, and of course, if you're interested um, in joining us or any more information, you can always email me and I will go ahead and turn it over to David. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. I'll go ahead and share our slides really quick for the IQ. Okay. Hopefully we can see that. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is David Kukla, and I am part of the IQ MPS affiliate, and I specifically serve on our strategic partnerships and communications team. And I just kind of wanted to take the next couple minutes to give kind of a quick overview of the IQ MPS, if you're not familiar. So the IQ MPS is currently composed of 22 member companies, and we have representatives from Drug Safety, uh, from 3Rs, ADME, and PDPK. And our leadership team is uh, currently made up of Rhiannon Hardwick, uh, Anya Kopek, um, Rhiannon David, and Jason Eckert. And then besides this leadership team, um, we have a steering committee that is composed um, of two individuals from each of our member companies. And we have four main goals um, as part of the IQ MPS affiliate, and that is to serve as a thought leader for both MPS developers and stakeholder organizations um, in the industry implementation and qualification of MPS models. Um, second, to provide a venue for appropriate cross pharma collaboration and data sharing to facilitate industry implementation and qualification of MPS uh, models. Third, to create focused engagement between industry and regulatory agencies. Um, and finally, to develop external partnerships and collaborations to help uh, enhance the inclusion of industry priorities. Um, and here are the IQ MPS affiliate work streams. And this includes manuscript publications, um, and we're currently working on several different publications right now. Um, regulatory outreach, uh, proof of concept studies through different pilot project teams, um, our strategic partnerships and communications team, um, as well as a landscape, uh, landscape gap survey team. And here's just an overview of our external partnerships over the past few years. Um, and in recent years, uh, we specifically co-partnered uh, co with the NA3RC and established an MOU, which allowed us to work together on uh, webinars and workshops, such as this one on vasculature today. And we are excited to continue our partnership uh, within our third year. Um, in addition, we engage with different external contact, uh, contacts, such as ARMI and NIST, um, as well as providing a year-to-end update and overview of landscape assessment through various surveys. Um, and that's kind of all I have for right now, but if you have any questions or want to get to know more about the IQ, feel free to reach out to us um, with any questions you might have. Awesome. Thank you, David. Um, Vincent, if you want to go ahead and unmute, share your screen, you can go ahead and kick us off with the first presenter will be from Memetis. Right, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Let's just share my screen. Go back to my introduction slide. Um, yes, so looks you should good. all be able to see my slide. Yeah. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Vincent van Duinen. I'm a scientific project lead at Mimetas. And today I'll talk about one of the angiogenesis assays we've been developing uh, and especially focus on uh, how we use it as a, a, a tool to do some compound screening on this. So within Mimetas, we think that a lot of the, the simple cell cultures uh, not always uh, uh, faithfully predict what happens in, in later clinical stages. Uh, but also, if you look at some of the in vivo models that have been used, uh, you see that sometimes uh, you get some problems with, uh, with efficacy or uh, toxicity problems in later stage of the, the clinical development. Um, so what we at Mimetas try to do is 
uh, to use uh, organ on a chip system that better uh, recapitulates uh, the complex diseases that we're studying uh, and hopefully give a, a better prediction on what's, what's going to happen uh, in, a, in the clinical stage uh, later on. So at the Metis, uh, we developed the uh, Mimetas organoplates. Uh, and the idea there is that we have a 384 valve plate format with uh, microfluidic channels integrated in the bottom of this, uh, this 384 valve plate. We have different uh, layouts and designs to accommodate the different tissue types that we try to mimic. Uh, and of course, today I'll talk about the, the vascular models that we've been developing in these, uh, these setups. Um, but the idea is uh, basically by having a trade for well split format is that we can use any liquid handling and any uh, yeah, uh, equipment that's available in the laboratory to have an uh, easy interface for all this, uh, this equipment. So we can use any liquid handler, pipetting robots, microscopes that, uh, that people normally use with, uh, with their standard uh, in vitro cultures. Um, and then also because it's all based on this 384 wealth placed format, we have ScreenBall uh, platform, and then we can uh, couple this to the, the pipetting robots uh, and then start to uh, to really scale these assets that we've been developing uh, and do uh, actually some screening on these, on these assets. So today I'll talk about an example in which we did uh, a compound screening using, using 1500 compounds. And then uh, I'll show you uh, later that, uh, um, uh, yeah, one of the examples of the uh, the anti-angiogenic uh, uh, compounds that we've that we've identified. So then going back to the organoplate uh, family, as we call it, uh, we have, uh, like I said, we have different layouts and different chip designs to accommodate the tissue type that, that we're interested in. Um, and all the way in the beginning, we made as we uh, initially started to work with this uh, with this two lane design, as uh, shown here on the left. And basically what it is, is like we have two, uh, two microfluidic channels connecting here in the middle uh, and the wells are using an interface. So basically what we do is we take, for instance, a droplet of ECM, we pipe that that's uh, in this wells plate, and then this droplet fills this microfluidic channel that is uh, integrated underneath. Once we added this, this, this hydrogel or the ECM, uh, after polymerization, we can then uh, introduce another cell type or another uh, uh, um, yeah, just another cell type in this perfusion channel that is adjacent to the channel uh, that you see over there. Importantly to know, uh, these channels are separated by a phase guide, meaning that if you pipe that ECM in one channel, it doesn't overflow into the adjacent channel. And that allows us to really uh, construct and build uh, uh, tissue models and, and, tissue and, and, and uh, uh, in vitro models um, by having more control over where we put the cells, where we put the ECM, and where we put the different culture media. Now, one step to the right, you see one of the different designs that we developed, and basically what we did there is we added another uh, additional uh, microfluidic channel in this one, and that gives us a lot more flexibility in how we design the, uh, how we design the tissue models that we built. For instance, uh, using this design, we are able to uh, generate gradients over the ECM, we can do uh, two different tissue types next to each other, and we can also study, for instance, migration into the into the ECM fully in 3D. One step further on the right, we uh, slightly optimized the design to further increase the throughput of this model. And then all the way on the right, you see uh, a slightly different design in which we basically uh, have a bigger gel chamber or gel area. And then uh, we have an, uh, an, an outlet on top of this gel chamber. And that allows us to get to gain even more flexibility because that allows us, for instance, to uh, to co-culture with organ arts or with sphere arts, uh, and then we can, for instance, start uh, using that to study the vascularization of of sphere arts. Um, within the metas, we also noticed that it's still uh, um, uh, we also developed some some additional hardware to to accommodate uh, the uh, the assays and the readouts that we uh, that we're using. Um, one of the things that we developed, for instance, is the rocker platform, and that allows us to simultaneously perfuse all the microfluidic, uh, all the microfluidic chips. We can uh, stack plates on top of each other, um, so we have the same perfusion in all the chips, uh, and it's, yeah, uh, it also uh, prevents the need for any pump setup. So it's, it greatly increases the ease of handling and the reproducibility as well. 
Then here on the right, you see one of the other uh, platforms that we've been developing is the, uh, the uh, transepithelial electrical resistance platform. Uh, and then we can, in high throughput, measure all the resistance uh, in the microfluidic chips. And this is, for instance, commonly used in, in membrane settings, but now we can translate these, uh, these types of assays also to fully 3D uh, microfluidic environments. Um, then if we take a look at the type of, of assays and the type of models that we've been developing at Mimetas, uh, I think you can, uh, 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 what, what, what often is done is that we create barrier tissues, meaning that we have uh, one cell type or, or, or a couple of cell types cultured against the ECM. So the ECM in this case here is in the middle, and then the cells that we add in the microfluidic channels, they grow into a confluent tube-like structure that is in full contact with the ECM. Um, of course, having the perfusion in the system also helps to, to develop the, the whole tubular structure. Uh, and then we can use this not only to create vascular structures, but also to create epithelial structures as well. Combining this with the tier setup that I showed you in the previous slide, we can also start to measure the, the electro electrical resistance of all these, these epithelial and endothelial structures. Then here on the bottom, you see one of the examples that we did with the organoplate graft format, uh, as we showed you earlier, in which what we did there is we cultured uh, um, First, some uh, some endothelial uh, or some microvessels in in, in microfluidic channels. Um, we expose these microvessels to a gradient of growth factors, causing them to undergo in androgenesis towards the center of these uh, these chips. And then, at a certain time point, we can add uh, spheroids or organoids on top. And then, uh, by continuing culturing these models, we can really start to see the interaction between the spheroid and the, the uh, vascular system. Uh, and even perfuse these organoids from uh, uh, by using the vasculature uh, that has been developed. Then here on the top right, you see one of the uh, more advanced co-culture setups. Uh, I think this is an example of the uh, placenta on chip uh, model that we've developed, but it shows you the flexibility of this system as well. We can uh, coordinate and position cell, different cell types within these culture systems, all fully in, in 3D. And then finally here on the bottom right, um, it's something that uh, we've developing lately quite extensively is the whole immune cell migration. So then we can, for instance, take one of the uh, vascular structures that we've been developing, uh, put immune cells in there and watch how they extravasate and uh, study the, uh, 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 the response of immune cells uh, in these systems. And because we use this uh, 384 well plate format, and really it's because it's a scalable system, we can actually perform some screenings on these uh, on these assays as well. So one of the examples I would like to talk about today is the uh, um, age-related uh, macular degeneration, or a a AMD. Uh, and this is one of the leading causes of blindness in, in uh, people uh, beyond 50 years. Um, and what, what it does, it causes vision loss, uh, vision loss uh, caused by protein deposition. Uh, and one of the driving factors here is, is endogenesis in the retina. The current treatment is uh, VHF inhibition, um, but that doesn't always show uh, good results uh, and also shows some variability between, between patients as well. Next to that, there's of course some side effects when, uh, when targeting the, uh, uh, the endogenic pathways as well. If we take a closer look at all the uh, um, of the disease pathways of AMD, uh, there's quite uh, quite some some mechanisms that play a role, and, and there's quite some progression in disease as well. Um, so there are multiple pathways or, or targets that we can engage in in targeting uh, AMD. And here on the right, you see some of the the, the types of tissue models that we've been developing, being its uh, neuronal cultures. Uh, today I will talk about the engenesis part, but we can also study, for instance, the, the, some uh, additional readouts on the vascular morphology uh, and the vascular permeability as well. Um, looking at the angiogenesis part of, of AMD and how to model this in vitro, I think a lot of people are familiar with the tube formation assay. Um, this one has been quite a, uh, the standard for quite a while to, to study sort of like angiogenic or endothelial cell responses. Um, and this usually starts from just single cells 
see that on the top of an ECM, and then you see form like sort of like these core life structures uh, form. Um, the downside of this is that it's quite a simplistic view of what happens during endogenesis, because during endogenesis, what happens is that you start from a single vessel and that starts to go on uh, endogenic sprouting. And that's something that we can better mimic using, using our systems in which we first grow an endothelial microvessel in one of these channels. Uh, next to that, we expose these microbiotic vessels to a gradient of growth factors, uh, and then we see complete remodeling of the of the ECM. We see the cells starting to invade into the ECM. Uh, you see directed sprouting or directed endogenic sprouting towards the high concentrations of these gradients. And um, after a few days of culture, you can actually see the first lumen start to appear. And uh, by continuing culture, you can actually start to perfuse these small microvascular networks as well. So what I'd like to show here is that I think with uh, the systems that we develop, we can better uh, recapitulate uh, what happens during during AMD. So this is what it looks like uh, under the under the microscope. Uh, so we take one of these uh, these three lane uh, forty organoplasts that we uh, that we have. Uh, we see endothelial cells in one of the top compartments. We see them at first. We see the ECM in the in the middle, of course. Then we see endothelial cells in the top compartment, and then we add endogenic growth factors in the bottom compartment. And what you can then appreciate here on the right is that you really can see the, the uh, a capillary network form that originated from the vessel that we cultured uh, in the top compartment first. Again, some closer detail on, um, uh, uh, on what, what, what this looks like. So here on top, you see a max projection of one of these cultures, I think after four or five days uh, in culture. And with the octagonal view, as you can see here and appreciate here, if we just take a slice going from bottom to the top, you can see that you can form uh, yeah, really tiny capillaries that actually um, are really close to the capillary size that we do have in the, in the body as well. And then from top to bottom, you can clearly see that the uh, that lumens are formed and the system is actually perfusible uh, through the lumens that are formed uh, by the uh, yeah, after, after entrances. Let's go to the next slide. Yes. So the next thing that we did is then, uh, because yeah, we can nicely show that we are able to model endogenesis, uh, the next thing that we did is to uh, to play around with inhibiting endogenesis. So here on the right, you can see an example of uh, the positive control being just exposed to growth factors in which you see endogenic sprouting. And then if you don't add any growth factors, also important, the vessel just stays uh, quiescent. And then by adding various inhibitors, you can see various Levels and modes of uh, modes of inhibition. Um, it's also nice to see that we can not only uh, study the anti androgenic potential of the compounds that we add, but as a uh, we can also measure toxicity in these plates as well. Because once you see an inhibition of the androgenic sprouting, you can show that you have some efficacy on on the androgenic pathways. But general vascular toxicity, you will notice by just the disintegration of the main parental vessel uh, from which the androgenesis originated from. So it's, it's nice that you can com nicely combine both efficacy and toxicity in the same, the same platform. Um, and then, like I said as well, because we uh, uh, make use of a platform that's easily scalable, uh, we perform the seeding using uh, piping robots. And here you can see one of the examples of just a lot of plates stacked on the organic plate rocker platforms. So all these plates are simultaneously perfused and all have the same uh, perfusion settings. Then we use a high content imager uh, to, uh, to take images uh, during the culture period. And then after a, a set amount of time, we fix the plate, we do some stainings, uh, and then we acquire uh, the nice immunofluorescent images as I showed you earlier. Uh, followed by, of course, some image analysis. So just to give you an impression of the amount of data that we end up with, uh, here you see a uh, nice uh, montage of all the chips that we've used within this uh, screening. Um, and uh, it would be a pain, of course, to just uh, all score this by hand. So we developed one, uh, a few uh, tools and algorithms to really start quantifying what happens during endogenesis. Things we, for instance, looked at is the uh, cytoskeleton of the, the chips, uh, and then we used a uh, machine learning algorithm to start scoring the, uh, the morphology of these vessels. 
Next to that, what we did is we also quantified the sprouting length by studying how far do these cells migrate into these uh, into these PCM compartments, which indicates the, the sprouting length that uh, that developed. And that's the data that we end up uh, later on. So every I think every uh, column here is a single individual organoplate. Uh, and on each organoplate, we of course have some positive and negative controls and some uh, some unknowns in there as well. Separating these out, you can see that uh, nicely see that the untreated vessels don't so any androgens at all, uh, and then the, the range of potential drugs either completely inhibit or uninhibited uh, androgenesis, uh, uh, and they lie somewhere between the positive controls and the, and the negative controls, as you see over here. Um, so then um, the results of the screen, of course, we had uh, we had to exclude some of the compounds that were that were toxic uh, in the screen as well. Uh, the case, of course, uh, using the protein kinase inhibitors, that you do have some uh, some side effects there, uh, but we can nicely uh, discard those based on the morphology of the parental vessel, uh, and we can show excellent C factors or C prime factors uh, showing that this assay can be really used as a high throughput screening screening assay. And then correlating uh, the different inhibitors that we use, we can also look more in, in closer detail on what are the pathways that we inhibited and does it correlate in what happens uh, what happens in vivo. Finally, what I'd like to show you is that uh, uh, yeah, what we're trying to do now is use this energensis model and try to integrate all the other models as well. So we're also working on neuronal models uh, combined with uh, energensis models. But also again with information just to get uh, to try to mimic uh, as much of the pathways that occur during uh, AMD and try to build a data set that uh, uh, yeah uh, that, that really shows where we can target uh, where, where we can target AMD the, the best. Um, so the results of this screen um, we ended up with we're testing 1500 uh, different kinase inhibitors we ended up with uh, 68 hits. Uh, of which quite a lot are newly identified and endogenic. So right now we're looking into uh, yeah, more toxicity studies, but also more fixity studies. Uh, and surprisingly, quite a lot of these compounds, uh, they were not used in the clinic or not tried in the clinic yet. Uh, so there's quite some potential there as well. Um, so to conclude, I think um, well, yeah, what I'd like to demonstrate here is that we can actually use these microphysiological, microphysiological systems to really perform high throughput screening, uh, demonstrated by the amount of compounds that we that we tested here. Um, and the thing was also nice to show is that using the phenotypic screening and the phenotypic readouts, uh, we can get we can extract a lot of information from these chips, uh, being it uh, asphyxia and toxicity. But combining this with all the other models that we've developed, we can get quite a good overview of, of all the processes that happen during, during AMD. Of course, it was not just me that uh, did all the work. There are quite a lot of uh, colleagues that worked on this as well. Uh, and yeah, the team is just growing bigger and bigger. So it's, uh, it's nice to see uh, how far Mimetus has come after, after 10 years. And with awesome. that, I would like to uh, thank you. And uh, happy to take any questions or answer them uh, later in the roundtable discussion. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Vincent. Um, if you want to go ahead and unshare your screen, um, and I'll go ahead and start um, having Christopher from Emulate um, go ahead and share him. I do see, Norm, that your hand is raised. Um, I'm going to allow your mic if you want to. I don't know if you have a question. Oh, okay. I see the hand is unraised, so I'm going to assume the question was uh, addressed. Awesome. So yeah, Vincent, if you want to mute and yeah, um, stop sharing camera, yeah, and then Christopher, you can go ahead. We see your slides. Uh, fantastic. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I am Chris Carmen, Senior Director of Biological Development at Emulate. Um, as you've just heard, uh, and I think we're going to be hearing more of in this webinar, uh, about models focused on the vasculature per se. Um, at Emulate, all of our organ uh, model chips are co-cultures with, with match, tissue matched microvascular endothelial cells. And today I want to talk to you about um, the benefits that that has in terms of supporting physiologic differentiation 
as well as uh, enabling uh, modeling of inflammatory disease and developing anti-inflammatory therapeutics. So first we need to uh, talk about our S1 chip. It has two channels. Typically we see epithelium in the top channel and primary human uh, microvascular endothelium that's tissue matched in the lower channel. It's separated by a porous membrane, which allows for cell-cell interactions as well as movement of cells and uh, and molecules between the two uh, channels. We um, are able to perfuse each of the channels with steady state laminar shear forces. Um, this is used to uh, perfuse differential medias of interest to introduce uh, compounds uh, as well as to sample the effluent uh, for various uh, endpoint uh, readouts. Additionally, we can apply an air liquid interface to the uh, upper channel uh, as needed uh, to model things like um, the environment of the lung. The fluid um, uh, perfusion uh, parameters are regulated by what we call the Zoe orb module, which applies pressures to the inlets and outlets um, that uh, control those, those flow characteristics. Additionally, you can see these two side ports uh, where we can apply vacuum, uh, which um, allows us to model cyclic stretch relevant to, uh, for example, breathing in the lung or peristalsis in the intestine. Uh, as I already said, all of our commercially available uh, model systems take advantage of this endothelial um, co-culture uh, approach. So now I'm going to just talk to you briefly about um, how this co-culture approach supports uh, physiological differentiation uh, of our model systems. In our first example, we're going to look at the proximal tubule kidney chip. Here we can see that in the monoculture, the uh, sodium phosphate uh, co-transporter, which is a marker of differentiation and, and functional uh, well-formed uh, maturation of the function. And uh, in the absence of endothelium, we can see modest levels of this transporter being expressed. You know, interestingly, if we co-culture with a macrovasculature mismatched endothelium from an irrelevant tissue, in this case, Hubex from the umbilical cord, that actually has dif uh, a detrimental effects on the differentiation. So the transporter expression goes down. Conversely, when we add microvascular endothelial cells from the kidney, uh, we can see a nice enhancement of transporter uh, expression and therefore differentiation. In a second example, we'll look at the colon intestine chip. And here we can see primary um, biopsy-derived colonoids cultured on the chip in the absence in the black uh, line and presence in blue of um, microvasculature, uh, microvascular endothelial cells from the intestine. And this uh, graph, which readouts permeability or, or the inverse of that is barrier function. And you can see that the presence of endothelium uh, dramatically enhances the, accelerates the rate at which these uh, um, uh, colonoids generate their characteristic tight barrier function. Likewise, on the uh, right, you can see that the presence of microvascular endothelium enhances um, the formation of the brush border, uh, as indicated by densely packed networks of elongated microvilli. And likewise, the characteristic polarization that you would see uh, in vivo is supported by the presence of microvasculature as read out by these differential transporters that uh, mark the apical and basolateral compartments respectively. Lastly, to more comprehensively assess this, uh, we uh, examined transcriptome. And uh, here we're looking at a principal component analysis. And you can see these um, three dots on the um, uh, left uh, represent colonoids and suspension in the absence of microvasculature, sort of the traditional gold standard, uh, versus on-chip uh, colonoids cultured in the absence in the middle and the presence of the microvascular endothelium. And what you can see is that the presence of the endothelium really drives divergence uh, of the profile toward the right 
And what we can see uh, is that that is associated with increased expression of genes required for morphogenesis of a physiologic colonic epithelial barrier. So altogether in two separate examples now I've showed you on two separate organ chips, we've seen that the presence of a tissue matched microvascular uh, endothelial cell in co-culture supports physiologic differentiation at the level of transcriptome, morphology, as well as function. So with the remainder of the talk, I'm going to pivot to the uh, role of this co-culture system in supporting a modeling of inflammatory disease, uh, in particular immune cell recruitment responses. And we're going to talk about that in the context of, again, sticking with the uh, colon uh, chip model uh, and the disease uh, that's relevant uh, known as inflammatory bowel disease. This is a complex inflammatory disease driven by recruitment of diverse immune cells from the blood into the tissues. I would emphasize that this process of immune cell driven uh, uh, inflammation is actually a central component of all major human diseases. And what all of those diseases share are these uh, four principal components. First is a priming stimulus. There's always some uh, damage, tissue stress, infection, something that um, causes the, the, um, the local environment become stressed. And what that, um, uh, what that, how that impacts the tissues is um, generation of biochemical changes in the local uh, milieu and microenvironment, which among other things, signal uh, expression uh, and activation on the endothelium of chemotractants and specific adhesion molecules that have the ability to capture subsets of specific um, circulating immune cells from the blood circulation, allow them to resist the mechanical forces of blood flow that normally push them downstream, and uh, allow them to find, subsequently migrate out and effectively become recruited into the local tissue microenvironment. Once they're there, they initiate effector functions, uh, which invariably includes uh, multiple cascades of cytokine and chemokine release, which escalate uh, and ultimately drive tissue responses, including barrier damage. And uh, this leads to tissue dysfunctions at multiple levels that fundamentally drive disease. So this is what we want to model. Uh, and if we want to do that, we need to capture each of these um, four relevant components. So how does that look like on the chip? Um, well, first, let's start with our priming stimulus. Um, we're um, going to introduce tumor necrosis factor alpha as an activating stimuli of the microvasculature. This is a, a well-established early driver of inflammatory bowel disease and therapeutic target in its own right. Additionally, in the upper channel, we're going to introduce um, a well-established um, co uh, cocktail of uh, human IBD-specific chemokines, which again are biomarkers and therapeutic targets in their own right as well. And what we're uh, going to do next is perfuse peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which is a complex um, uh, combination of multiple different immune cell types. And uh, those are going to be flown at high physiologic, uh, high shear rates in order to capture uh, the required uh, physiology. And uh, from there, we expect to see uh, attachment of subset of the P PBMCs egress into the upper chamber, into the epithelial compartment, where they will begin to um, elicit uh, chemokine and cytokine effector responses that ultimately drive barrier dysfunction. In simplicity from a high view, uh, what our goal here is really to introduce minimal human disease relevant priming stimuli, add the immune cells, and then let the natural biology take over to develop the, the disease model. So in this next slide, I'm just gonna um, speak to um, the initial um, first uh, critical step, which is the attachment and recruitment component. And what we can see here is that on a primed chip, the perfused PBMCs indeed attach and uh, show recruitment to the epithelial channel. Uh, we're looking at a, a 3D rendering of a confocal stack through the channel uh, in the center of this image. And what you can see is that 
um, labeled in yellow and blue, we can see the cells that are attached to the endothelial channel and those that are migrated up to the epithelium. We've uh, developed quantitative uh, algorithms uh, and scripts that we can apply uh, to robustly quantify this. Uh, and you can see the bar, uh, the bar graph on the right. Uh, we can see the, the, the total signal and the stratified uh, signals measuring uh, amount of cells that have been recruited uh, and attached to the endothelium respectively. Now, the other thing that this channel is showing is something that's really critical, uh, and that is selectivity or specificity with respect to an inflammatory uh, signal. And what do I mean by that? Well, we all have millions of white blood cells in our circulation, millions per mil indeed, uh, in circulation constitutively. And for the most part, those stay uh, compartmentalized within the blood. They only egress out in the presence of appropriate pro-inflammatory uh, signals, uh, which really are control specificity in time and space. And that's exactly what we're able to recapitulate here. Um, the, the column on the left shows uh, a low level of attachment in the uh, absence of a priming stimulus and essentially no migration to the upper channel. Uh, whereas when we have a priming stimulus, we have a, a really dramatic increase of recruitment. So we're able to capture here inflammation selective recruitment of a subset of immune cells. And I just want to emphasize uh, for a moment briefly the important role of the high uh, flow rates that I've indicated. Um, the graph here on the right um, shows you um, data similar to the one in the last uh, figure that I showed you where we're getting this nice selectivity. Um, but what we can see is when we slow the flow down to um, sub-physiologic levels, that we lose that differential uh, selectivity. So um, this really just emphasizes that these flow parameters are critical to recapitulate uh, the selectivity you see in vivo. Next, I'm just going to talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about selectivity at the level of tissue specificity and immune cell subsets. And specifically, uh, we're going to talk about um, this molecule alpha four beta seven. Many of you will probably know that um, a substantial portion of our circulating immune cells are devoted specifically to uh, surveilling the uh, microenvironment of the intestinal tract. And um, these are marked by alpha-4, beta-7 integrin. These are adhesion molecules that have the ability to selectively bind to MADCAM, which is specifically expressed only on the microvasculature of uh, inflamed um, uh, intestinal tissues. And what we can see is that um, when we perfuse these cells through, um, they dramatically enrich uh, in terms of the subsets that's recruited into the intestinal tissue about to greater than 60%, uh, showing that we're actually capturing the expected uh, selective recruitment of these gut-specific immune cells into this gut chip. And I wanna highlight that these numbers are precisely what you would see if you sampled the blood and a biopsy of human IBD patients respectively. So um, just to recap on this part, what we've uh, shown is that by introducing uh, a disease and specifically IBD specific uh, minimal priming cue uh, together with um, intestinal microvascular endothelial cells uh, at flown at a physiologic shear rates, we can capture selectivity of recruitment at the level of uh, both inflammation selectivity and tissue uh, specificity. So what are these cells doing uh, once they're introduced into this microenvironment? So um, to address that, we developed a panel of human disease specific IBD uh, cytokine and biomarkers uh, greater than 12 altogether were uh, assessed. And what we see is, is that every single one of these shows substantial upregulation in a PBMC dependent manner. And we're just showing two of these, uh, IL-22 and interferon gamma uh, graphed out here. Uh, and these are uh, particularly important as they have critical direct roles on generating the uh, expected bear dysfunction, which we speak to in the next slide. So this graph um, shows apparent permeability where we have uh, fluorescent tracers that can be sampled in the upper lower chambers to give this uh, signal readout. And I'll just walk you through this slide briefly. The light gray uh, bar on the 
left shows us a negative control where there's low permeability, high barrier, and this is a resting, well-differentiated uh, colon intestine chip. The dark gray bar on the other side of the graph shows us a positive permeability control where high dose of interferon gamma is administered directly to promote a uh, barrier leak, as you can see. And then the magenta bar and the blue bar show us a perfusion of PBMCs through the chip in uh, the absence of cytokine in magenta, whereby you'll remember there's uh, little recruitment and little cytokine production versus the blue bar where we can see the PBMCs are recruited in a prime chip uh, and they do develop cytokine um, in the effluent. And um, this demonstrates that we can uh, capture a, an immune cell dependent uh, disruption of the bearer. And that's actually pretty significant because it suggests that, again, starting with a minimal priming cue and just introducing immune cells, we can capture all the pathogenesis steps uh, from the initial attachment, the recruitment, the cytokine, uh, the cascade development, uh, all the way through this hallmark feature of this disease of bear dysfunction. Now, what's implied by that is that with this more complete set of pathogenic uh, or pathogenesis, we are capturing a more complete set of therapeutic targets against which to develop therapeutics. And with that, I'll just go to this last slide and just um, 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 tell you how we're approaching this uh, aspect. So the entire point of the exercise uh, up until uh, what I've shown you is really to model human relevant complex disease for the sole purpose of enabling more effective uh, development of therapeutics. So what we're doing in order to validate that is we're moving forward with uh, validation of clinically relevant human IBD therapeutics on this model uh, using diverse small molecules, biologics, with uh, and, and stress testing that against multiple uh, mechanisms of action and targets. And uh, so the, the four we validated so far include dexamethasone, uh, which is a classic corticosteroid, AGM-3100, which is an emerging small molecule inhibitor of uh, uh, alpha-4 beta-7 MADCAM adhesion. And then the um, really important new anti-TNF uh, therapies that are in clinics now. All of these um, in part uh, function or their therapeutic effect in part through uh, disrupting and uh, the recruitment response and i don't have time to go into the data today but we validated that in fact all of these molecules on our chip uh, do do so to various degrees as well as suppressing downstream uh, effector responses so um uh, this with this validation in hand uh we're now pursuing and, and supporting uh, multiple customers who are developing new pipelines with new therapeutics uh, toward this disease and I just want to end by zooming out a little bit and uh, just stating that what I've walked you through here is um, just uh, one example on one organ tissue model and variations on this theme are, are being developed and played out to model multiple inflammatory diseases across multiple uh, tissue models. So I hope I've given you a, a good idea of our approach and, and some uh, sense of uh, the, our capabilities and, and where we can go. So with that, I'll uh, thank everyone for your attention. Awesome, thank you, Chris. So if you wanna go ahead and stop sharing your slides, unmute and turn off your video, um, I'll go ahead and welcome Corwin from Draper. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great, let me just share my slides. All right, are the slides visible? Yep, all looks good, go ahead. Great, all right. So my name is Corinne Williams from Draper, which is a not-for-profit engineering research institute in Cambridge, Mass. And I just wanna thank the organizers for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'll be talking about our PREDICT 96 platform um, in the context of a, a particular study that we did looking at endothelial and fibroblast interactions, um, which was a collaboration with Pfizer. So the premise for this project is fibrosis, which is a major healthcare burden globally, uh, which is currently has no effective treatments and it can affect many different tissue types. Um, so brain, lung, heart, skin, et cetera. 
Um, and while all those tissues are very different, you know, a common theme is that there's a lot of evidence that, um, you know, initial pathogenesis starts with pericytes and fibroblasts that are within the perivascular space in these organs. So if you, know, you look at these, you know, cell types in that space, um, and if you stimulate them with a profibrotic factor, such as TGF-beta-1, uh, these cells will modulate to an activated myofibroblast phenotype, which is often characterized by expression of alpha smooth muscle actin, or SMA, and increased uh, ECM synthesis, such as collagen, um, which are, you know, a few of the key hallmarks of that state. And so, you know, these cells being in a perivascular space, they're in close proximity to endothelial cells. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, the, these cells have been studied in the context of other cell types. So, you know, their interactions with epithelium or with immune cells, but not as much with endothelium. And so that was the, the question that we wanted to look at in our model was, you know, how do these endothelial cells uh, affect the response of pericytes or fibro fibroblasts to profibrotic stimulation? And so, as we, you know, we heard from the last talk very nicely that, you know, the interaction of cells with endothelial cells or other cell types is really important because it can affect cell or even whole tissue responses to perturbations. And so, you know, some very initial work has been done, um, you know, in terms of how endothelial cells can regulate response in rat liver. So, for example, LSEX or liver sinusoidal endothelial cells can help maintain hepatic stellate quiescence, but there really isn't much other work done beyond that in, in the context of endothelial cells. Now, a lot has been done the other way, you know, looking at how support cells uh, can provide stability to endothelium. And we did some initial work on that in our platform. Um, so initial development of our model, which is sh uh, shown in our scientific reports paper. You know, for example, if you try to perturb the barrier in a co-culture versus a monoculture, example shown in this permeability assay here, the monoculture becomes much leakier, much faster um, compared to a co-culture. Uh, similarly, if you do a cytokine stimulation in the mono versus co-culture, um, so for example, dosing a TNF alpha, uh, you get less of an, an inflammatory or cytokine release response uh, in response to that when you have a co-culture versus a monoculture. So again, we've kind of looked at how, you know, these support cells affect endothelium, but now we want to look the other way and see how the endothelial cells can influence those other cell types. So our per platform is the PREDICT96 platform. That's a pretty versatile system that is also relatively high throughput. Um, so we've developed about a dozen different organ models at this point. So you may have heard about our kidney model at uh, previous workshops. Hopefully you'll hear about more in the future. Um, but focusing on the vascular model, what is uh, particularly unique to this platform is our high flow pump, which is shown on the left here. So this is a, a pneumatically driven pump. So you can see the, the pneumatic lines coming off the bottom here. And what you see these circles here are the individual micro pumps that are on this lid that goes with the, the microfluidic plate, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, so these pumps are all individual. Um, so there's 96 of them arrayed on the, the pump lid. And they're capable of flow rates that can achieve up to seven to eight dynes per centimeter squared in the PREDICT platform. And there's also dual reach of control. So you can control the left half of these pumps versus the right half and look at you know, how different flow regimes can affect uh, model response. Uh, these pumps are durable. You can sterilize them, reuse them. We've had pumps in you know, operation of over dozens of experiments uh, over multiple years at this point. And then the PREDICT plate uh, is made out of thermoplastic material. So this is a, a disposable plate. It's in a standard well plate uh, format, so very familiar. Um, the interface is a 384 well plate. You might see the shadow of some of these wells that interface with the, the microfluidic stack. And there's 96 of these devices arrayed on the plate, kind of in a regular you know, 96 well pitch. And the devices are bilayer. So now if we, this is a top view of the plate. If we now look at the vascular model, and this is a you know cross-section side view. Um, in the top channel, we typically seed our fibroblasts or pericytes. And then these channels are separated by a microporous membrane, and we can control the porosity and topography as we like. Um, so we use a, a one micron for our vascular model. We see the endothelial cells on the opposing side of that membrane, and then those endothelial cells are exposed to fluid shear stress from the pump. So to tell you a little bit more about how the pump works. So 
as I mentioned, it's uh, pneumatically driven, it's uh, programmable, and the flow recirculates. So this little picture here on the left shows, you know, you just put the pump lid on top of the plate, and then each of those devices has its own pump. So these are all independent. And then the schematic shows a little bit about how it works. So flow gets picked up from one of those wells on one side, gets dropped onto the other, and you can create a volume differential that then drives flow through the channel. So here's a schematic just showing a low flu fluid shear stress, which for purposes of this presentation is defined as 0.5 dynes per centimeter squared. And then for our high fluid shear stress, we can get up to seven dynes per centimeter squared. And we've looked at various ways uh, you know, to validate endothelial cell response. So we know cells will elongate and align. They form really nice monolayers. And we also did this uh, cool study with uh, Guillermo Garcia Garcia Cardenia at Brigham and Women's, where we took their KLF2 reporter cells and we put them in the platform. And so KLF2 is a shear responsive factor. And as you increase shear, you see increasing expression of KLF2 in this, you know, kind of like dose responsive manner. So for the, the studies that we're going to perform in co-culture, uh, this is just a quick overview of the experimental timeline. So when we have the co-culture, we see the endothelial cells first. We then start shearing them the next day, give them a few days to stabilize. Then we come in and see the fibroblasts or parasites in the top part of the channel. And the next day we do our activation with TGF beta. And then we wait about 72 hours before we do our endpoint assays. So most of what I'll talk about is our uh, staining for smooth muscle alpha actin or SMA. Um, also talk transcriptomics. So before we got started, as I'm sure many people know, um, there's a lot of donor to donor and cell type variability. Uh, and so we wanted to pick a you know, cell type that would be fairly responsive to TGF beta. So this is just an example of the, you know, the kind of screening study we can do. This particular example shows uh, retinal pericytes on the top half of the plate, the dose curve of TGF beta, uh, starting from highest on the left, going down on the right. We can also get inhibition with ALK5, for example, and then again repeated with stellate cells. So if you look at this image, um, this is imaged on a, you know, Opera Phoenix. Um, so the plate is compatible with, um, you know, high content screeners. You can see that, you know, these cell types have very different responses. And then just a kind of more simplified view of the data. We've looked at a lot of other different fibroblasts and pericyte types. Um, and this just shows, you know, some quantification of that data. Uh, with our max responder at 100%, and you can see that drop off with TGF beta concentration. So, you know, not all of them respond the same way. So, we wanted to pick one of these high responders or high to mid responders. So, for the, the rest of this talk, I'll focus on the um, dermal fibroblasts and how they interact with endothelial cells. So the, the main thing that we found is that when we put fibroblasts in co-culture with the endothelial cells is that that co-culture reduces um, activation um, in terms of S, uh, SMA expression. So representative images are shown on the left here. So showing both the low and high fluid shear stress conditions. So we can see the monoculture is here. There's very robust activation. Uh, the green here is the endothelial cells. Uh, they're nuclei stained with ERG. And then again, SMA for the activated cells with TGF beta, and so we can see some reduction of that um, once we have them in co-culture. And so we can quantify that, again, by mean fluorescence intensity of the SMA. There's uh, no effect that we've seen with fluid shear stress here. Um, from some earlier studies that we did, we know that fluid shear stress is important for reproducibility of the model. So if you do this in static culture, it's a lot more variable and the responses are uh, not as robust. So fluid shear stress is important um, from that perspective here. Um, and again, really the big driving force here is the co-culture that reduces that SMA expression. Um, it also happens at the gene expression level. So this here shows also collagen one as well as TGF beta receptors. So this is not, this reduction in the co-culture is not necessarily due to a change in TGF beta receptor uh, expression. Um, so there's something else driving it. We also observe this with other cell types. So the, the phenomenon is uh, pretty generalizable, at least in our study so far, in terms of how endothelial cells can regulate these different support or perivascular cells. So to try to understand what was going on, um, you know, these cells are cultured on either side of a membrane. And so the what we suspected was the driving forces maybe secreted factors coming from the endothelium. So we took 
uh, conditioned media, um, we looked at both fibroblasts as well as endothelial, and we did co versus monocultures. So we kind of looked at all the different permutations. We took that conditioned media, put it onto fibroblast monocultures with or without TGF beta, and looked at the response. Um, so I'm not going to show all the images, but just a, a select few. So this is you know our control condition where we get very robust activation when we just have TGF beta alone. But when we have the EC conditioned media, we get that blunted response. And we see that here quantified here. Um, if you do it with the fibroblast derived media, it, there's no effect. So it's really very much uh, coming from that endothelial um, cell culture. So now the next step is to try to understand what is driving that. So uh, we first ran a Luminex panel. We looked at uh, quite a few factors. I'm just showing a select number that we thought were most interesting from the Luminex. 19 of these happened to be enriched in the endothelial channel. So we kind of looked at, split them up by you know, roughly high, mid, and low, low expressed. Um, and then we took those you know, high to mid range and we looked at how those you know, factors might affect uh, activation of fibroblasts. And so the short answer is um, these highly expressed factors that we picked up on didn't have a significant impact on fibroblast activation. Um, interestingly, some low expressed factors may contribute um, to reduced activation. So this is just an example of a couple that we looked at. Um, also keeping in mind that there could be some synergistic effects of these different factors and certainly Luminex isn't going to capture everything that is in you know, the culture. So to get further insight, uh, we also looked at uh, some single cell studies and just a very uh, quick overview of some of those findings um, I'll show here. So these are just uh, the UMAP plots for the endothelial cells and the fibroblasts. So you know we can see these different populations popping out um, in both of the cell pop cell types. Um, won't go into details about what each of these are, um, but if we just look a little more closely at the fibroblasts, and we look specifically at ACTA2, which is the gene that uh, encodes for SMA. Um, what is interesting is we see a couple populations that seem to be very uh, rich in ACTA2 expression compared to some of these other populations. So the interest, interesting thing here is that there are specific subpopulations that respond to you know, this TGF beta stimulation and we can now start to tease apart you know, which of those cells are responding and how is that affected by you know, co-culture and monoculture. And then just a, a few other snippets from our single cell studies. Um, so we were able to pull out a bunch of differentially expressed genes, you know, what's enriched in the endothelial cells versus the fibroblasts. And one of the nice things that we saw is that a lot of those factors that we identified in the Luminex also popped out. So that was a nice validation for us that we're seeing that correlation between what we're seeing in the Luminex versus what we're seeing at the gene expression level. Um, of course, we identified a whole bunch of other uh, factors that we didn't even pick up in Luminex because obviously it's limited. So things like the, the TNF superfamily, various FGFs, interleukins, and a lot of ECM related factors that could also be playing a role. And then, uh, you know, again, just a sort of a snippet of what we can look at, you know, we can start to see different roles of cell cell signaling. So, you know, one thing that stood out to us was, you know, pot potential role for notch signaling. So this is becoming uh, kind of more interesting in the literature, uh, a lot more papers showing, you know, the interaction between notch one on endothelium and notch three on fibroblasts or pericytes and how those cells interact um, there. And so, you know, we see notch one kind of expressed all throughout our endothelial cell populations. And here with notch three, you know, we do see it kind of popping up a lot of places, but it's also kind of really localized to our, our activated cell populations, which is interesting. And so I know we went through a lot of data really quickly, uh, but just to quickly summarize the uh, our Predict 96 platform, we've actually used it for a lot of different models, but you know, in this particular study, looking at cell specific interactions with endothelium and how we might be able to identify new targets uh, that could be endothelial specific uh, in this particular context. And we can achieve both the combination of throughput and shear in our platform, which is you know obviously important for endothelial health and just establishing a nice stable model and getting reproducible results. Um, it's compatible, the platform is compatible with a lot of different assays, as I've shown you, um, in particular, for example, doing high content imaging. And then, for, you know, from these studies, kind of the main finding is that, you know, endothelial cells are, report, are important to this response. They're regulating fibroblast uh, activation, and there are certain, you know, from the studies that we're doing, we're getting insights into, you know, what could be potential targets for these cells in the future. 
Um, so in terms of next steps, you know, we can start thinking about incorporating immune cells because, you know, that's important in fibrosis as well. And starting to think about these multi-omics approaches that we could do in the future. And so with that, I would like to acknowledge the team and again, the organizers for the opportunity. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Corwin. Um, so if you want to go ahead, and I don't think we have time for questions at this point, but we'll do them during the roundtable. So as a reminder to everybody, um, feel free to put any questions either in the chat or the Q&A. Um, if for some reason you're unable to access those, you can always email them to me. And with that, I'll go ahead and welcome Deborah from Synvivo. Yep, I can see you. I see you unmuted. And your slides look great, so go ahead. Great, thank you so much, and thank you to the organizers. Um, the, these sessions have been really awesome so far, and we really appreciate um, being a part of this. I'd like to talk to you today about um, incorporating some vasculature with complex geometries and to model human blood vessels in an organ on a chip technology. As this other previous speakers have described, you know, the human microvasculature really impacts a lot of different aspects in terms of our drug delivery and in terms of modeling these very complex interactions between tissues and, and drugs themselves. And for many therapeutic interactions and, and applications, the very first interaction is with the human, human blood and the blood vessels themselves. And it takes, you know, entering into that kind of superhighway before they reach the disease targets. And as a result, a lot of our therapies are dealing with physiological flow and they're dealing with sheer stress. And they're also interacting between immune cells that are that are present in the circulation, and that can also impact drug delivery. So that we know that having vasculature within our in vitro models can really increase our predictive ability in terms of how drugs are delivered, how efficacious they are, and overall, you know, their, their total impact on multiple tissues. So at Synvivo, we offer a variety of different organ on chips. We have several different microvascular networks that were that are present and were modeled on um, microvascular beds that were taken from scans of human or, or mouse-based capillary beds. And these microvascular networks are then pat patterned um, so that we get the same kind of bifurcation angles that we would observe in vivo. And then these complex microvascular beds can then feed our tissue chambers that contain our epithelial cells. So it allows us to have a very realistic and dynamic in vitro model and also to model complex morphologies of tissues and organs, and including different rates of perfusion of nutrients into different um, types of tissue beds. We're able to achieve physiological flow and shear stress and, and really create and model unique microenvironments. And that enables us for our drug delivery studies to do this in a very dynamic way via the vascular flow. We have a library of different microfluidic designs, and these have been applied across several different types of models. And you may have heard of, of some of these models in some previous talks, but they include things like the blood-brain barrier, our inflammatory systems, our, our tumor biologies, our lung air liquid interface systems, and also things for toxicology. Today in the talk that I'm going to give, I'm going to focus a lot on some of our microvascular beds that again have this kind of unique geometry that um, comes kind of from in vivo uh, uh, microvascular patterns. And I'd like to describe using these particular type of chips in a couple of different applications that and how the modeling of the microvasculature and in, in with these unique bifurcation angles can impact things such as drug delivery or drug efficacy. What does inflammation look like in terms of how the immune cells respond to these kinds of angles, how immune cell interactions occur when they are incubated with, with whole blood and flown and uh, perfused through these types of chips, and also vascular toxicology. So with our endothelial vessels, um, as you can see here is modeled, we get a lot of great uh, endothelial morphology and the cells can move and, and shift. Um, in real time as they stretch and align under flow. And we also get um, aluminized vessels. So even with these um, unique bifurcations and these angles, we'll get um, a complete lumen formed across this. And this just again allows us to really um, kind of model what the microvasculature would look like in vivo. 
sorry, let me see. So then for a lot of our systems, when it comes to drug delivery, um, our preliminary studies had started off with these microvascular beds and we would embed a tumor into this red section that you see here and would allow that tumor to be fed with that microvasculature. And we were looking at different nanopolymers to look for anti-cancer efficacy. And we were comparing and contrasting what would happen if we delivered the drug directly onto the tumor site itself, or if it was delivered through the vasculature, or if that nanopolymer was introduced to tumor cells, kind of in 2D you know, uh, tissue culture plate situations. So one of the things that was observed in this particular published study was that if we directly um, inject these nanopolymers onto the tumor itself, we would get great uptake of those nanopolymers into the tumor mound itself, and, and we would see really good eff efficacy in terms of, of cell killing. And when we were Looking at a 2D culture system, both types of nanopolymers seem to be efficacious in terms of anti-tumor activity, but of course in our 2D well systems, we couldn't deliver it through the vasculature. However, when these vascular, when these particular nanopolymers were introduced through the vasculature, the nanopolymer A was able to really effectively uh, perfuse from the vasculature into the tumor site, and then also be uptaken by the tumor and, and introduce effective killing. However, with our second polymer, a polymer B, what ended up we observed was that the, the polymer itself didn't cross the vasculature as well, and, it, and much less of that material got into the tumor and was actually uh, showed a, a decrease in terms of cell killing. When we observed the vasculature more closely, the nanopolymer was actually accumulating and forming um, conglomerates um, within and attached to the vasculature itself so it couldn't cross the barrier. So in these particular cases, the microvascular beds were really informative in terms of then understanding what was happening in vivo, where mice that were injected with this polymer B were dying, and it was because they were getting um, embolisms that were forming in the vasculature itself. So our drug delivery system um, in vitro was able to mimic and actually point to a mechanism of why we were observing specific effects in vivo. So then our applications here for drug efficacy, one of the responses that we observed as well is that endothelial cell barriers from different species often can show differential responses to our anti-inflammatory treatments. In this case, we, this study was done in using one of our idealized designs, but was looking at primary human brain microvascular endothelial cells and comparing them to those taken from mice. And in turn, this, these studies were performed on endothelial barriers and looked at both permeability of a 4 kilodalton dextran molecule and also at tear to look at um, the responses in tear. And without treatment, um, there wasn't you know, there was there were some differences between the human and the mouse microvascular cells. But what we observed, especially after TNF alpha activation, was that the human cells responded much more strongly and had actually a much more permeable barrier compared to the mouse cells. But then when we incubated those cells with um, a, a treatment that would ameliorate um, with PKC delta inhibitor, we found that the human and the, the mouse cells kind of responded to that uh, similarly. When we looked at TIR, the interesting thing was, was that TNF-alpha treatment also showed a significant change between the human and the mouse cells in terms of TIR, uh, tier responsiveness after TNF-alpha treatment. But the interesting thing as well was that TIR responded very differently in the presence of the PKC delta inhibitor. So we can observe from these studies that our microfluidic models themselves can in induce some responses, but there is also a species-dependent endothelial response that can be modeled using organ on a chip. So when we were looking to at, at modeling immune cells, our response here was to, to definitely introduce primary immune cells and to look at their responses in terms of how they are interacting with our microvascular beds. And in this uh, video you see here, we are introducing uh, primary neutrophils that are, are rolling and, and attaching to our endothelium and then adhering through using the migration pathway. And then these cells can then, um, if, if we're in the presence of a tumor, can migrate across our barriers and then um, come in and enter into the tumor chamber itself. 
when we applied this uh, model, when we were looking at inflammation to look at in vivo, one of the interesting things that we were observing with our primary um, white blood cells is that we would get specific adherence closer to the bifurcations and the number of cells that adhered to to distances further from that bifurcation was were decreasing. And you can see that that's mimicked here on the right-hand side, so that the distance um, away from the bifurcation, um, you see fewer and fewer cells that are, that are adhering. And this mimicked what was observed in vivo. So we can see that our in vivo microfluidic um, vascular beds can mimic the same in vivo adhesion patterns of white blood cells that's observed in vivo. So one of the interesting studies that have come from the use of these microvascular beds is a question of what happens when nanoparticles are delivered by the vasculature, but they're interacting with whole blood. And one of our groups and collaborators down in Monash University was asking that question and also asking if, if the immune cells that are present in the circulation could act and interact with these nanoparticles differently based on the particle size, but also whether or not they were interacting with them under static conditions or under fluid flow. And so they did a really nice study kind of looking and, and, and isolating different types of, of cells within the circulation from a PBMC mixture, and then looking to see how they were either binding to the nanoparticles statically or with flow. And the particles ranged in size from 400 nanometers to 150 nanometers. What we observed here is that, especially like with B cells, they observed that many of the nanoparticles were adhering um, both under static and flow conditions, but that for the mid-sized nanoparticle, the fluid flow actually reduced the number of nanoparticles that were adhering to the B cells. However, for additional sites, the larger nanoparticles seem to be most affected by fluid flow in the case of monocytes and neutrophils, um, but very few of the smaller nanoparticles bound to those cells, whether they were under static or fluid flow conditions. So this particular study really kind of illustrates a number of different things. For one is that, you know, the adherence patterns of these nanoparticles was, was specific to cell types. So different types of immune cells reacted differently um, to different size nanoparticles. But also that cell association within the circulating whole blood was really also dependent on the size of the nanoparticles themselves. And finally, one of the areas that uh, we've been very interested in with our microvascular beds is how, um, when we're delivering anti-cancer drugs through the vasculature, is there impacts on the tumor cells, but also on the vasculature itself. We have several different chips that allow us to have both high perfusion and low perfusion zones, meaning the distance between the two different vasculatures allows certain areas of these uh, chips to have uh, highly oxygenated media, but that oxygenation and glucose content can decrease the further distance between the two vascular beds, allowing us to model things like hypoxic cores for tumors. But the interesting thing also in terms of the endothelium is that these different types of, of micro micro patterns can also influence the shear rates that go across these, these endothelium and can lead to different responses in the presence of anti-cancer drugs. And that's illustrated here on the right, where in our high perfusion uh, chip, we were looking at the vascular viability once we were delivering doxorubicin or paclitaxel. Our high perfusion chip showed um, a, a reduction in viable cell density of our endothelium in the presence of doxorubicin, whereas it, it was less impacted by the delivery of the paclitaxel. And this was also true in our low perfusion chips as well. So these microvascular beds can model not only toxicity of specific drugs to the tumor cells, but can also show any negative impacts on the vasculature. So finally, I'd like to thank everyone for, you know, for your attention and for listening. We, we really um, have a, a great um, uh, appreciation and depth for our endothelialized and vascularized systems because these can generate such robust models and lead to some real um, and dynamic in vitro conditions that model what's happening in vivo. And I'd like to acknowledge all of our team here at in vivo. And if you have questions, I would really appreciate um, you know, receiving those. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Deborah. And yeah, as a reminder to everybody, feel free to put any questions in the chat or in the Q&A, or if you're having issues, just email them to me. 
Um, I don't see any for um, Deborah specifically right now, so I'll go ahead and invite Eva from Tisius um, to go ahead and yep, share slides and I'll confirm both verbally when all looks good. OK, great. Uh, also from my side, thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to present today. Awesome. I hope all looks good. Slide should. OK, great. Yeah. So uh, at first I'd like to present you uh, our company tissues and our intro introduce you to our product, the Humimic chips, before I go into uh, more detail on uh, what we have in terms of vascularized models on chip. Um, we are a spin-off company uh, from Technical University Berlin, founded um, no, now 13 years ago. We are still a rather comparably small team of 32 employees, uh, slowly organically growing from um, revenues and, and uh, what we make with our customers only from selling chips and from doing in-house uh, contract research uh, testing, but also in-house assay establishment. And yes, we have an ISO uh, qualification, so we have sound management, uh, quality management system. Um, so this is the components of, of our solution. So, so what we need when working with uh, microfluidic multi-organ chips. Um, uh, of course, it's the biology, the organ models. Here's an overview of the different organ models that we've been working with before. Of course, within this talk, I'll focus on the vasculature. I put this up just also to show you that uh, our chips are rather versatile. So we're able to integrate um, organ models from various sources. So from uh, primary cells or uh, the cell lines, IPS drive models, to but also including tissue slices, uh, commercially available models. Uh, because our chips, they have standard cell culture um, sizes of 24 well or 96 uh, well sized. So also uh, standard transfer models from Koningmatic, uh, other companies that can be included. Um, we have various multi-organ chips. Um, in combining either two, three, or four organ models in a microfluidic circuit, so it's a really a multi-organ co-cultures, and those are actuated by um, by standalone pump systems, and um, the chips have an onboard. Um, an, an on chip pump. So uh, all the microfluidics, uh, the, the media, the cells are really, um, that they're kept within this small microfluidic circuit. There's no external media reservoirs, no external pumps. So um, this makes it also very interesting for including um, uh, vascularized models and also for including uh, flowing immune cells, for example. Um, the chips there are compatible with live tissue imaging because they are closed from underneath with a microscopic glass light. And as I said, uh, as the organ compartments themselves are of either 96 uh, or 24 size, they're compatible with uh, standard tissue uh, culture inserts. And um, today I will not talk about those models, the, the, the insert type models, uh, but on, on the onto vascularized models. But of course, what we also have uh, experience with is including those um, barrier models, so the, the, the insert models with having endothelial cells uh, below on the lower side of the membrane, and then the um, other organ types inside the, um, inside the transverse, then putting them in the microfluidics and observing the shear stress and the flow on the endothelial uh, and uh, organ co-cultures. And we also have, have a small paper on that out um, having showing a BBB and a neuronal model co-culture. Um, those are the, the standard chips that we have uh, co co um, combining two up to four organ uh, models. Um, and uh, all of those chips, they are compatible with the vascularization uh, technology that I will show in a second. But of course, uh, apart from those those standard microfluidic chips that we have, we are also able to do rapid prototyping, so to do um, custom specific chip arrangements and cook organ organ model arrangements. This is then how it looks like having the chips in a standard incubator. So the tubes that go in there uh, are only um, supplying the chips with the pressurized air or the vacuum, then pulling up the membranes or pushing them down to have the on-chip microfluidic perfusion. Um, um, we showed previously that we can uh, seed our, all the technical channels, so the, um, the channels of the chips uh, with endothelial cells. Uh, we showed that with uh, HTMAX, UVAX, or also IPS-derived endothelial cells. So flushing uh, single cell suspensions in there, the chip, the cells adhere to the uh, to the channels and then elongate within the flow nicely. It's also uh, my previous speaker has, um, has shown you. 
and um, and the the cells then attach to all the cell surfaces, all the surfaces of the chips, and form this uh, nicely closed um, layer. And yes, the cells they do behave behave differently, comparing static to dynamic perfusions. Um, but now uh, the idea was not only to have uh, the endothelial cells inside the technical channels, but also uh, generating uh, vascularized organ models. So having hydrogels with a channel included connecting to the channels of the chip so that we can see um, PBMCs, um, lymphocytes flowing through the channels, then possibly also being retained or invading the hydrogels and the organ models. Um, we have two different technologies now available um, to generate those those structures the structures in the chips it's either um, integrating fused deposition modeled uh, parts uh, into the chip or doing a directly on chip printing using photolithographic technologies and then we have these these um, sacrificial st sacrificial structures in the organ compartments we can uh, overlay them with um, different hydrogels uh, so various hydrogels uh, and then have um, those channels inside the hydrogels after the structures have dissolved, and uh, then connecting to the to the um, technical channels. Um, I'll, I'll later on show you some results uh, of the fused deposition modeling, but here also uh, some pictures of the float photolithographic approach. Um, so the 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 channels then the. the the, the sacrificial, sacrificial structures, they dissolve, uh, leaving uh, channels inside the hydrogel. They can then be seeded with the endothelial cells and the serial cells attached to all surfaces um, and then uh, eventually start outgrowing. And yeah, so, uh, and as I said, uh, they are, those technologies are compatible with all the different chips that we have. Um, at low pumping rates, so um, the, we can dynamically control the fluid flow and the shear stress on the cells um, by setting different parameters in our pumps and uh, having low pumping rates, uh, which corresponds here to about 2.5 microliters per minute. Um, we see that we can cultivate uh, HDMAX here for over prolonged uh, periods inside those hydrogels and the organ compartments. And uh, at low pumping rates, we do not see any changes in, in, in morphology outgrowth. And this also does not depend on channel uh, dimensions. So uh, we have had smallest channels in the hydrosis of 400 micrometers, then going up to 120 micrometers, um, the cells they attach and they uh, make a nice confluent monolayer layer and then are stable over prolonged culture periods. Um, when flushing um, the fit stack strain, seven, uh, 70 kilodalton into the chips, we see that when there's no cells um, seeded onto the, the channels, of course, the, the fit stack strain uh, goes out and uh, goes and penetrates the hydrogel uh, after 10 minutes, uh, whilst uh, after, with, with channels that have been seeded with HDMAX, uh, already after one, one day after culture, uh, we see um, a nice mono layer uh, that then um, hinders the fit stack run uh, in, in getting to the hydrogel. Uh, when we increase the pumping frequency, um, um, then we start to see an outgrowth of cells uh, into the into the hydrogel. Uh, this is um, HDMAX seeded into the hydrogel. Um, at day eight, we are stained with calcium AM. We already see some, some outgrowing structures. Um, here are some stains after 14 days with fits actin derby. Um, now we continued in wanting to um, to to uh, stabilize those structures and also um, direct them because before they have been uh, non-directed, of course. Uh, we integrated, we started to integrate also endothelial cells or stromal cells into the hydrogel um, before then also seeding the channels uh, with endothelial cells. And and yes, of course, they, they are, they are um, vascular structures, network-like structures formed inside the hydrogels and they also do connect to those um, outgrowing structures and we are now um, currently um, uh, by applying other organ models and also growth factors gradients, um, studying the 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 um, vascularization of organ models and the directed outgrowth and stabilization of of vascular structures in those hydrogels on the chips. And yeah, 
with that, I already want to close my presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eva. So we do have time for any questions. If you want to direct them directly to Eva, I'll give people just a minute or two. Um, again, if you want to put it in the chat or the Q&A or to me via email, whatever is easiest for you. Um, awesome. Okay, yeah, with that, um, yeah, we'll go ahead and I know we have some questions for all the companies in the round table, but for now, yeah, we'll have Chris um, come online and yeah, let me know if the sharing is working for you, Chris. I'm getting there. Um, this. Mm -hmm. is we see the slide deck, just not in presentation mode quite yet. Okay, we can start from the beginning. Wonderful. How's that? Okay. Yeah, all looks good. You're good to go, Chris. All right, thank you. Been having a wonderful time with teams today, as usual. All right, thank you for the invitation, and um, we'll tell you what we do at Arakari. So I've been using this a lot lately. I, hopefully everyone has seen this by now. I mean, it, it's just was exciting news to everyone in the chips field to know that uh, the FDA is now uh, taking these platforms very seriously. So good news for all of us. So for those who haven't seen any of my presentations before, um, I'm going to go through what our platform looks like. For those who have, um, apologies. So what we and I think everyone is trying to do is, is capture this sweet spot between the simple um, systems that we've been using for years, these monolayers, monocultures, and the physiologic, the definition of which is, is human. And there are lots of models that lie along this spectrum. Um, mice, as we all know, are great until they're not. Um, a lot of people have done some nice work with spheroids. But we're all interested in microphysiological systems uh, which try and capture the best of both worlds. So what we have is something we call the vascularized microorgan. Um, it's going to be quite similar to much of what you've seen, but with some interesting differences, I think. And um, like all of you, we base it on the vasculature, the high pressure arterial side and the low pressure venular side. Uh, we schematize it this way, uh, microfluidic artery in red, vein in blue. Um, we have various shaped tissue chambers, but uh, typically we've got this diamond shaped tissue chamber into which we inject matrix of various kind um, in a slurry with cells, uh, including endothelial cells and stromal cells. And then the endothelial cells over time will form a vascular network spontaneously. So this is not pre-patterned, this is biology driven. Basically the cells form the vascular network that they feel is most appropriate for the tissue. Um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, we've now uh, got all this on a, a 96 well plate. So we can put 16 individually perfused tissues on the, on the uh, footprint of a 96 well plate. Um, no pumps, no tubing. Uh, it's all gravity driven. Uh, we have some different versions of this which have um, higher wells so we can get a higher, uh, uh, a higher head of pressure so we can drive fluid through these vessels at different rates uh, based on the hydrostatic head. And you can see how it lines up with the wells of a 96 well plate there. Uh, there's three little diamond shaped tissue chambers and you can see the tissues forming nicely in there. So that's the basic platform. Um, this is why we do it and um, this is kind of condensing a lot of what we've heard this morning about why do we go to so much effort to make vascularized organs and the most of the issues are, are pretty obvious. This one may be slightly less so to some people in that tissues are patterned um, through a lot of crosstalk and some of those signals come from the endothelial cells in vessels. And so vessel-derived signals 
actually helped to patent some tissues that was first shown by Undine Cleaver in pancreas and has been shown for multiple tissues since. And this is independent of anything the vessels deliver through the blood. Most cells are close to blood vessels, obviously. Drugs and nutrients are delivered that way. Um, critically, immune cells are delivered through the vasculature. So we've been doing a lot of work in this area, uh, particularly in immuno-oncology, where we feel it's important to deliver the cells in, and reagents, um, such as biospecifics, in a physiologic manner. And so to best model human disease, we need vascularized and perfused tissues. So this just uh, some images showing you what it looks like. The larger vessel there is the arteriole, and you can see the capillary is sprouting off that. Um, there are no missing cells where you see gaps. That's where the cells have, been, uh, have not been transduced. We transduce to uh, express fluorescent proteins, but we don't sort or select. So we get about 90, 95% of cells expressing the fluorescent protein, in this case, M. cherry. Uh, we can run blood through this. And importantly, the flow of this matches what you see in skin. Uh, so we get areas of low flow and areas of high flow. And again, the overall flow rate is controlled by the hydrostatic head. Uh, we see physiologic permeability. Uh, here we're putting through 70 kilodalton fitzy dextran, the size of albumin, and you can see there's a slow leak of that. Uh, if we use something the size of an antibody, 150 kilodalton fitzy dextran, then we get a slower leak. Uh, we can calculate the permeability coefficients. And as I say, those do match uh, what you see in vivo. Because we have blood vessels, we're interested in leukocyte delivery and adhesion. So on the left, uh, we have ICAM staining in green. You can see that that is luminal, uh, as you would expect. In white is collagen 4, so you can see that there's a nice basement membrane laid down there. We can treat the vasculature with various inflammatory mediators, in this case TNF, and we can induce adhesion molecule expression. BCAM, E-select, and, and ICAM, etc. Here we've run through monocytes, um, and you can see in green the monocytes, they are inside the vessel, uh, the white arrowheads. There's one in the process of extravasating, which is the yellow arrowhead. And then there are some have already taken up residence outside the vessel, which is the white arrows. We can quantify adhesion and extravasation of these cells. Um, and then here's just some other images. Again, uh, these are TNF treated vessels and you can see uh, a PBMC in the inset there is spread out over the surface of the endothelial cell um, and is probably in the process of extravasating. So I'm just going to tell you some of the things we can do with our base platform, our VMO. Um, we can grow basically any tissue that we want in these platforms. Uh, here I'm just showing you some tumor data. Um, we can grow any type of tumor. We've yet to find one that doesn't grow. Uh, here are some examples of colon cancer, uh, breast cancer, the MDAs. You can see those are highly invasive. Uh, the MCF7s, you can see grows a much tighter knot. Uh, glioblastoma is interesting. You can see in the top right there, these cells very much favor the vascular niche of the blood-brain barrier. So we have a blood-brain barrier model that we use for this. Um, so we're very interested to understand this interaction between the tumor cells and the vascular niche. Um, and the bottom right is a different design of the platform here. We are using uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis cells, colo 205s. You see the vasculature in green and in blue a peritoneal mesothelium in a second chamber. And you can see in the inset there that we have vasculature underlying the peritoneum in blue and the colo 205 cells. We can deliver those through the peritoneum and they will um, grow on the surface of the peritoneum. And we're interested to see how those can invade the underlying tissue. So we can do various tumors, we can use different geometries, we can make them tissue specific. Just some data, here you can see top growth of a colon cancer 
in our platform over time. Uh, standard of care blocks growth of that tumor very nicely. You can see that uh, on the right, we've quantified this. Uh, we can also reproduce this in spheroid cultures. Um, however, if we look at triple negative breast cancer, this is the MDAs. Again, you can see these are highly invasive cells. Uh, they do respond to taxol, but because of their high invasiveness and lack of stickiness, these cells don't make spheroids. But as I can see, show, as you can see here, um, they do grow very nicely in this platform. Uh, the VMT, which is the vascularized microtumor, the tumor version of the VMO, is ideally suited to immuno-oncology. We can deliver multiple cell types through the vessels. These will adhere and extravasate. You can see in the image here, lymphocytes have come out of the vessel and have uh, migrated to the tumor, and we can see tumor killing. We've done PBMC, CAR Ts, gamma deltas. We've looked at antibody drug conjugates, as I'll show you, by specifics. All of these, are, um, our platform is ideally suited to testing these kind of therapeutics. Uh, here's some CAR T data. You can see extravasation increases over time. We can block this with an anti ICAM antibody. Interestingly, the anti VCAM didn't work in this assay. Um, so we're just investigating if that may not be as good a blocking antibody under flow as it is under static conditions. And this is just the time course um, of tumor killing. You can see a CD19 control has no effect on tumor growth over time. But in um, the green, these are EGFR specific CAR Ts, which are targeting this tumor. Um, and you can see we get nice killing there. But if we add an ICAM antibody in purple to prevent extravasation, then we see no tumor killing. Uh, we've done work on immune mediated toxicity. This is the poster child of failed clinical trials, Theralizumab. I think everyone knows the story of that. Um, what we found is in the absence of PBMCs, this drug had no effect, but in the presence of PBMCs, caused massive cytokine production and increased leak of the vasculature. Uh, this is a study we did for one of our clients uh, looking at, um, this was a, a phase one study that they did, produced unexpected toxicity. Uh, this is thought to be vascular in origin. They gave us various formulations, A to F of their drug, which we tested in our platform with some controls. And then we looked at what came out of the vessels uh, with the, in the venous outflow. TNF's negative control, there's nothing in our platform makes TNF, but we did see strong induction of MCP and IP10, uh, even more than by LPS. And so we could confirm the findings from this phase one toxicity study, um, showing that their reagents do indeed cause vascular tox. Um, we've also looked at vascular toxicity in the VMO with antibody drug conjugates. Um, these uh, nicely blocked tumor growth, which is what you're seeing there, but unfortunately they had the side effect of increasing vascular permeability, so they had these unfortunate uh, side effects on the vasculature. Uh, another look we had at vascular toxicity was a TLR8 agonist. Um, as you can see on the right, adding the drug had no effect on vascular leak. However, in the presence of PBMCs, we now got strong vascular leak. Um, and this is because this agonist targets the monocytes. Monocytes secrete cytokines. The cytokines trigger vascular leak. So to see this kind of phenomenon, we really need this complex multicellular system that includes perfusible vasculature. And finally, um, a, a new model we've been developing is for uh, lung toxicity. Uh, we have um, vasculature, we have lung stroma now. And what we looked at was whether we could see um, expression of um, lung specific markers. So on the right in this table, we had total lung control. You can see expression of these markers. And then when we used any of the cells individually, we didn't see much expression of any of these genes. However, when we put the vasculature, the stroma, 
and the pneumocytes together, then we could create this nice lung stroma model that we're now using to look at um, drugs that might target um, various lung diseases, including fibrosis. And so these are the kind of models that we have based on a vascularized microorgan. Uh, we have the base model, which is a generic tissue with vasculature. We have the tumor model. We have blood-brain barrier. We've developed a lung stroma model. Uh, we've got a couple of vascular malformations we're working on, um, and several other models are in development. In the platform, uh, we can do direct imaging of cell growth, migration, survival. Obviously, we can do permeability studies, vascular tox, doing a lot of work on leukocyte adhesion and extravasation, uh, drug delivery, efficacy, uh, tumors I've shown you, doing a lot of work in immuno-oncology. These kind of models are uniquely suited to this. Many of these reagents are human-specific. And so mouse models are just not very effective in the immuno-oncology space. These vascularized microtumors are. And as I've shown you, we can do in situ micro uh, immunofluorescence. Um, and we can also extract tissue from the platform. And we've done uh, qPCR RNA-seq. And we're getting some really spectacular data doing single cell RNA-seq out of the platform. And of course, we can collect outflow, as I showed you, for ELISA and mass spec. So to summarize, tissue and tumor microvirants are complex. We need these model systems. Mice are not people. It's important to remember that. Um, and we have multiple models now, um, including custom models that we can do. So um, if anyone's interested in a new model uh, based on the VMO platform, uh, we can uh, develop that. Um, and then here's our wonderful team. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and invite all of our presenters today to go ahead and turn on their cameras if they like. It will now be time for the panel Q&A. Um, I'll ask you guys to mute unless you are actually answering um, one of the questions. Um, so I do have a few questions. And again, to all the attendees, um, go ahead and put any questions in the chat or the Q&A. Um, I also want to thank, again, thank all the presenters um, for their excellent um, presentations today. It was very exciting to learn about all the different vascular models um, at your organizations. Um, so the first question um, is, how are the companies um, like Emulate, although I'll actually throw this out to any company, handling or not HLA matching slash mismatching of PBMCs and the source of endothelial cells, intestinal cells they are incorporated with, et cetera, um, i.e., are these cells coming from different patient sources and or does it matter in the MPS development or responses to disease models? Um, so since this was originally directed to emulate, I'll ask Chris to answer it first and then allow the other presenters to chime in as they like. Uh, Chris Carmen. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, it is something that comes up often. Um, there are some workflows that we've come around where we um, are um, actually HLA phenotyping uh, in order to potentially um, uh, mitigate uh, mismatch, but the reality is for the vast majority of the applications that we're developing, it's probably not very important. In the absence of a lymph node apparatus and an uh, presenting cells, and also the, in, in the absence of extended time courses of, of weeks, um, it's very unlikely we're going to develop adaptive immune responses in these settings. Uh, and uh, particularly, you know, in the absence of initial lymph node priming, the, the reactive cells are going to be very rare. So it's something we we are uh, thoughtful of. We generally think it's not a major issue. Uh, we do have some uh, customers and workflows where actually will be working toward uh, matched materials. Awesome. Thank you. Um, um, yeah. yeah, go ahead, I, Chris. I do have some things to say on that, actually. Um, a lot of work I did as a postdoc was on antigen presenting by human endothelial cells, which are, so primates are quite different to mice in that uh, endothelial cells are quite good antigen presenting cells to memory cells, but not to naive cells. And you can get quite strong allogeneic 
interactions um, with endothelium in, in humans. So it is something to be concerned about, especially if there are inflammatory mediators around. So if you upregulate class one or induce class two on the endothelial cells, then you run a very high risk of getting allogeneic interaction that can happen in 24, 48 hours. So Chris is right that in longer time courses, it's okay as long as you don't have inflammatory mediators around. So it is something to be concerned about. Um, there are obviously huge logistical challenges in MHC matching in these kind of platforms. We are looking into, as Chris said, trying to minimize MHC mismatches between leukocytes and endothelial cells specifically. Um, if it's a possibility, you can use blocking antibodies. Um, a lot of the time what we're doing at the immuno-oncology is actually trying to get um, autologously matched or closely matched at least some MHC alleles. So generally for class one, you can get nice matches at A2 because 40% of the population of the US are A2 positive. So if you need matching, you can do it at the A2 locus for class one, uh, but you do have to bear that in mind um, that there could be allergenetic interactions, especially in the presence of inflammatory mediators. Thank you. Do any of the other presenters? Yeah, go ahead, Eva. Yeah, I think one very beautiful way uh, of working around that one is to use uh, IPS-derived endothelial cells. Uh, of course, there's not uh, for, for all of the different subtypes protocols around, but for some types, we have beautiful um, protocols for differentiating endothelial cells out of IPS cells. And uh, we at Tissues, we have a, a bank, IPS bank of six different donors. We also have their PPMCs, allocophoresis material in stock, which then, of course, can be used uh, in those devices. Awesome. Other presenters want to chime in on this question. OK, awesome. Um, so the second question I have is um, if any of the companies can discuss um, successful examples of their systems with pharma as data for FDA or other regulatory purposes, or if they're in process, their best guess on timelines or where they are in the process. Um, and so I'll go ahead and give those presenters that haven't spoken yet, if you want to chime in first. Um, I don't know if any of you can share. Um, Corin, can you share or do you have anything? I'll just kind of call out names. Uh, I don't hear you, Corin, which is strange because you are unmuted. <laughs> Mm -mm. Still don't hear you, which is strange because we were we heard you just fine during your presentation. How about now? Yes, awesome. Okay, yeah. sorry about that. Um, so we do, we do have a number of collaborations with pharma. Um, and I know at least some of them are using the platform, but at this point, it's kind of kind of out of our hands on what stage it's at. So okay, Got can't it. disclose. <laughs> totally, totally. Um, Deborah, anything to add or that you can? I think we're we're in similar situations as as Corinne mentioned as well. Um, you know, we do have collaborations with pharma, but um, in terms of those stages, uh, we're we're not able to. We don't know where that's quite at yet. Got it, uh, Vincent. Yes. Uh, well, the example that I showed you during the presentation, the uh, screen was performed together with uh, with the pharmaceutical company. Um, also, here I'm not exactly aware of the status that the project is right now. I think uh, the, the hits are to be identified. I think we still need to do some validation testing there before actually moving towards clinical trials. Um, but I think that's definitely on the agenda for the for this uh, uh, collaborator. And uh, we have a lot of other uh, firms with companies collaborating with, with us as well. Awesome. Um, Eva? Yeah, same, same. So it's uh, used for in-house decision making, but not for regulatory purposes. Yeah. OK, uh, Chris Carmen. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, lots of interactions with uh, pharma right now um, where we're specifically using our immune cell recruitment inflammatory models uh, to uh, support various pipelines and we're having good success in that front. 
Um, toward the regulatory component, uh, I just mentioned that we uh, conducted an elaborate study about a year and a half ago on predictive validity of liver toxicity, where we studied more than 20 compounds that had moved through murine models and ultimately shown uh, to develop uh, significant human uh, uh, liver tox. And uh, in this study uh, of those uh, 20 molecules that were missed by the murine system, uh, we had, I think, a 90% uh, hit rate. And so um, we are in active talks uh, with that published uh, work, uh, by the way, which was um, performed in guidance from the IQMPS um, to, um, we're, uh, to develop and get approvals for that uh, from the uh, FDA. Awesome. And last but not least, Chris Hughes. Uh, you're muted. Sorry, I was getting some background noise from you, so. No, you're good. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, we, uh, like Chris, Carlin, we're, we're doing a lot with a lot of different pharma companies. Um, it's all pretty early stage stuff, lead validation, um, that kind of thing. So uh, not nothing, I don't think, that, that's close to FDA filing yet. Okay, awesome. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, another question is, turnover of endothelial cells in vivo is very slow compared to other cell types and in tox studies. Sometimes it may take a long time, delayed, to see toxicity associated with test compound-induced endothelial dysfunction. So I wonder any case example of successfully detecting delayed endothelial toxicity using MPS models. Um, does anyone have an answer to that question? I, I, I suspect, I, I'm not a toxicologist, so I'm, I'm kind of winging it here, but I suspect a lot of the toxins associated with proliferating cells, so endothelial cells don't proliferate very often. But when they do in the presence of a, some kind of toxin, that's probably when you're seeing the effect. So in vivo, the effect might be slow, but given that everyone's using growth factors in their platforms and their endothelial cells are proliferating, I suspect a lot of that tox will be quite apparent in these platforms, but I'm guessing. Yeah. Anybody else have other answers to that? Yeah, go well, ahead, Corin. Oh, er, <laughs> yeah, let's go Corin first. Go ahead. All right. Um, yeah, it's a great question, and there's definitely a lot of, I think, cross regulatory government interest in that question as well. So um, some of you may know that NASA with some other agencies is funding uh, longevity of tissue chips up to six months. So there are a few groups that are, I think funded by that, uh, we are, we're actually one of them. So we will be at some point um, in the future, near future, looking at those kind of long-term time points. Awesome, uh, Vincent. Yeah, no, what, what I want to add is that uh, we do see in our models that uh, with, and with the vessel that we killed, we see quiescence at some point, uh, like really slow turnover. Um, and I, remembering from my, exper my experiments like a few years ago that we could uh, maintain the, the quiescence for yeah, up to quite some weeks, uh, up to 60 days or even longer. Um, but yeah, I don't, I exactly, don't exactly know what time points we're, we're looking for, but. Uh, uh, Maintaining it in culture for for extended period is uh, definitely possible. Awesome. Anything else to add from the other presenters? Okay. Any other anything else in the chat or Q and A? I'll kind of give the um, attendees one more chance to ask any questions. And if there are no others, um, I will go ahead um, and once again, oh, I see a question. OK, so this question is in order to utilize the data generated from OOC for drug application to the FDA, do we need data generated from the lab that's under regulation, such as a GLP certified lab? Do any of the presenters want to chime in on this one? I would just say that I think it's an important question, but um, I don't think any of us really have the answers on it. We're kind of in uncharted territory now. Um, it's something I think we're all going to be giving a lot more thought uh, moving forward at this point. Yeah, 
that's what that's that's what I would say. We're still pretty early on, you know, a lot of those questions in terms of regulatory acceptance. But um, as we will will be coming out with a paper from the Three R's Collaborative, um, although regulatory acceptance is certainly a very important aim for MPS, all of the internal use of MPS, even in discovery and other applications, is incredibly useful and helps us gain confidence in the system. So um, I always encourage people to not get overly focused um, on the regulatory aspects um, when there are so many other beneficial ways to use MPS. Um, so with that, um, I know we are at our original, um, just a little bit past our original ending time. So we'll go ahead and wrap up the webinar again. Thank you to all of the presenters. Thank you to all of the attendees. Um, we really appreciate um, your work today, your work in the field, all that you do for NPS, all that you do to um, refine, reduce, and replace the use of animals in research. Um, we will, we have recorded this presentation. We'll be processing it, um, cropping it, taking out the little breaks, putting it on YouTube on our playlist um, and emailing all the attendees. So um, I'll get all of the presenters emails um, sent out again, if you were a registered participant. Um, so you can always ask them questions directly. And if you have other questions about MPS, you can always direct them to me. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and close out this webinar. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Bye.